approved or quietly dismissed. If you brought your Bibles, you can open Deuteronomy 7. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about the awe factor. What is there about God that causes you to stand in awe of Him? And what is the result of our recognizing awe in the presence of God? Deuteronomy 7, verse 14. Mo hmm. Guess what? This is supposed to be Deuteronomy 10. Could you switch that to Deuteronomy 10? Great. Then how do I start off the sermon right? I haven't done this for a little while, have I? Go to Deuteronomy 10, 14. Sorry about that. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. And yet, on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even above all peoples as it is this day. Moses is pointing them in the right direction as they head into the promised land, and he says, be aware of the fact that the God you serve and the God who leads you into the promised land owns the heavens and the highest heavens, and yet he set his love upon you of all peoples. We ought to be in awe of that. And you say, well, I had to say yes to God. I understand that. But the New Testament is very clear that there is an element of his choosing and calling us. If it weren't for the, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We should be in awe of the fact that God Almighty knew our name and said, I want you. Hallelujah. Verse 16. Then he said, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Now, if there's anybody here that has never stiffened their neck before God, I thought we'd just take a moment and have one of us who stiffened their neck. You know what it means to stiffen your neck? Back then, all the plowing was done by oxen or horses. And they didn't have horses, huh? Oxen, and they'd have a, a yoke. And they had to have that yoke put on their neck to do the work. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light, but it's still a yoke. Ever stiffen your neck before God? You knew he was, okay? So Moses said, don't, don't stiffen your neck any longer. For the Lord your God is the, is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. Verse 21, you shall fear the Lord your God. Oh, that's verse 20. That's good too, though. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him and swear by his name. Verse 21, he is your praise and he is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. And so I just pause and ask you, has God done any great and awesome things in your life? Has he given you the fruit of the Holy Spirit and made you happy when you couldn't even imagine being happy? Yeah. I was thinking while we were worshiping God, my refrigerator is a collection of the things that inspire awe in me that God has done. There's a few things I'll never take off. One is the sanctuary because it came from the heart of God. It's a lot nicer than what I prayed for. Or, I mean, or, okay, I, I, believe me, if you had seen the 7-Eleven, we've had it for years, you would it again, I'm in awe. The other thing that always creates awe in me, I have a picture of the 25 people a couple years ago. This church in this little town sent 25 people to Mateo and Manuel's hometown and Ordebelio's hometown. 25 people! That's amazing! Only God Almighty could send 25 people from this size church to minister in another country, the first evangelistic campaign they had at that time. To me, that inspires awe. Yeah. Well, what Moses says is he is your praise, he is your God who has done great and awesome things for you. Well, the reason I'm trying to hit this hard tonight is because you're not if you're not in awe of him, you will be in awe of somebody else. Mm -hmm. yep. We'll get there. So, of course, you know why you'll be in awe of somebody else? Because you were created to worship. You can make a decision. I will not worship. Oh, you'll worship something or somebody. We were prayed to worship. And um, Hollywood is out to tell you who to be in awe of. A whole lot of different people, all right? But God says, let's, yeah, let's pay attention here. Oh, so according to Deuteronomy, number one, is the Lord an awesome God? And number two, do we have or should we have a sense of reverence and awe before him? Did you know that the early church, it says, was in a continual state of awe? Go to Acts 2. We're not going to be very long tonight. We're just going to worship for a little while. I believe that 
the worst mistake a Christian can have when they're really all out for God, devoted for God, busy for God. Everybody say busy for God. Busy for God. You can get so, that's not a bad thing, is it? But you know what? If you don't spend a little time in the presence of God, just worshiping Him and let Him minister to you, you can forget why in the world you're doing all this. Have you ever done that? Yeah. I'm looking at the busiest people in this church. Yeah, you can get to why am I doing this? Now, this is a picture, Acts 2.42, of the early church. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Mm. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. If we ever lose our understanding of who God is, we'll lose our reason for serving him. We'll, I mean, what I started out tonight was a whole different message. Is why in the world it, should we have a church that goes on year after year? Why should we have three services a week year after year? And the basic answer, when it comes right down to it, for, and, and the other thing I ask is, I ask myself, why should we have, like we were talking about Sunday morning, when God comes, his blessings come with him. Why should we have a church that seeks his face, that gets together and pray? And the answer is very simple because we're living in spiritually dangerous times. Yeah. And if you do not have, if you do not have your roots in a church that has clarity about its purpose and its mission, you know, if you don't have that time in God's presence, pretty soon you like each other, but you don't love each other a whole lot. Do you know why we like each other so much and love each other so much? Because we've been in the presence of God. And he, you Amen. look better after I've been in the presence of God. Amen. I look a lot better after I've been in the presence of God. Uh -huh. All the, yeah. Here's a definite thank you, Mr. Morgan. I appreciate that. <laughs> Read this with me. Awe. An emotion variously combining dread, veneration, and wonder that is inspired by authority or the sacred or the sublime. Now this is Merriam-Webster's dictionary. I didn't doctor it at all. And you know the first time you read it, well, you think, well, you can't leave dread in there talking about God. Listen, if you're a sinner going to hell, you better dread that. There should be a holy dread. When we stand the, I do want to say this, you've never been in awe of God yet. And I know I've said things like that before. We love him. We will not be afraid of him. He's on our side. But let me tell you something. You think you've been in awe of God? Wait a minute. They, I've heard descriptions of people who've been privileged to go to heaven. I said, just the noise around the throne of God is momentous. There's continual flashings of lightning. It's in the book of Revelation. Why is the center of the power of the universe? We think we know who our dad is, and we do to a degree, but you'll understand you'll know a lot more yeah. in that day. So it says that awe is an emotion. It's something that moves you. Variously combining dread. Now, I do believe that once you're born again and your, your sins are washed in the blood of Jesus, there's a holy awe and fear. I have no trouble translating the word fear, fear. I know people, some people, they, you just take all that out. So we'll be cool Americans and say reverence. Well, it is reverence, but I, I obey God because I do fear him. He is my father and he's God of the universe. <laughs> if you don't fear him, there's something wrong with you. I don't have to fear anybody else if I fear him, so I'll fear him. Awe is an emotion variously combining dread, which is gone if you're under the blood, but fear remains. Veneration. Just a sense of this holiness and wonder. I believe that wonder is at the heart of awe. Somebody just got back from the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I haven't been there since I was 10 years old, but at 10, when I was 10 years old, you, you can take all the pictures of the Grand Canyon and the world, and you can't see the Grand Canyon until you stand there and you gasp. Mm -hmm. How many of you have met the Grand Canyon? You've seen it. Mm -hmm. it you just, uh, you, we've got tremendous pictures. I know we do. And until you stand there, it's just mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. We should have a sense of wonder when we think of the fact that God has chosen us and loves us and, and cares enough about us to have a mission and a purpose for your life. I read an article a few weeks ago, it was online, and it was about leadership traits, and sometimes I'll just take a minute and read, and it said that the one great leadership trait that will inspire a company's workers to go farther than any other is the leader's ability to inspire awe. Now they say it's a rare trait, 
But they, you know, what did Steve Jobs do? He got them convinced that the, the iPhone was going to change the world as we know it. You know, this is all inspiring. Jesus Christ, everywhere he went, walked in such love that it was so well inspiring that all he had to do was look in their eyes and say, follow me, and they followed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. Nobody in Jesus' presence ever asked that they were loved. Read the New Testament. Nobody said, do you love me? It was simply a given. That love inspired such awe that successful men, of, successful men walked away from the, the, their vocation when he said two words. We see awe as optional. You know, we can come to church. I mean, I went to church all my life, and I never stood in awe of God because his presence wasn't there. And I'm not criticizing those people. We didn't really, I did love him, and I feared him. But when you really get in the presence of God, there's not a lot to say. We see awe as optional, but the truth is awe is essential for a radically successful Christian journey. Now the truth is if you ever lose your sense of awe and wonder about Jesus Christ, the world may succeed in turning you away. And you say, well, that's a terrible thing to say. You realize that there's people that 30 years ago were serving God that aren't serving God. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you're going there. I'm just saying we should be aware of that. Yeah. I mean, there is, I'm, I'm just going to use a name. A guy named Tony Campolo used to go to CBN. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. There are very few people on the face of the earth my husband couldn't stand. My husband loved people. He just didn't have a hard thing toward people, did he? But that guy would come to CBN University because before it became Regents University. And we were one spirit. I mean, I wasn't working at the university, but my dad was, my husband was, they all said, just nobody knew what color anybody's skin was, and nobody cared. We were brothers and sisters in God. And he would go, and he would stir up racism big time toward the dean of, the dean of the English department. She was a great lady, a lady of color. She got so mad at all the racism in the place. And my husband came home brokenhearted. He said he destroyed something wonderful that we had. Well, it was rebuilt. Love will rebuild. But you understand? Okay. But if you had asked somebody then, will he make heaven? Everybody would well, sure. I mean, he's serving God. He's just a bit of a troublemaker, you know? It is on Charisma Online right now that he is advocating that every single church in America do same-sex weddings and embrace. Okay? We just, lay, we just lay the word of God down. Now, I don't know how far you have to go to lose your salvation, but I don't want to go there and see. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my point. I want to be so in awe and in wonder of what Jesus Christ has done in my life, the impossible, he had, that I never even think about despising his word, that I never think about causing disunity among the brethren. Go to Psalm 22, verse 23. We're going to be about 10 more minutes, and we're just going to worship for a little while. And you say, why? Well, do not raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you a question. Do not raise your hand. Anybody? How many of you have spent 20 minutes absolutely quiet before God this week? Mm -hmm. Just standing in awe. Did you know we're commanded to stand in awe of him? And that's not for, just for his benefit. That's for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Psalm 22, verse 23 says, Oh, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. Now, would we be, uh, we're totally on board with the praise and the glorifying, right? Mm -hmm. But then it says, and stand in awe of him, mm -hmm. all you descendants of Israel. Yeah. Are we commanded to just spend some time? Do you know what happens when we spend time worshiping God? There's a great exchange that takes place. Because our inherent lack of glory is exchange for his inherent glory. Did you know he's glorious? Yeah. Uh, you, there's People all across America are looking for something, and they haven't figured out what. You were made to be loved on a level that not even your spouse can love you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that love from God, you'll be mad at your spouse as long as you live. Yeah. I wonder, and this is pure speculation, but I wonder about the woman who was sweet-talked by murderers into giving them help, all right? I wonder. She thought she had going to get something from somebody that she wasn't getting from her husband. If she had been satisfied in Jesus, now I'm telling you, okay, this is, I'm telling you it's dangerous not to be satisfied in Jesus because the world is holding, and it doesn't satisfy, but it claims to satisfy. 
You stand in awe of God and worship, you'll be so satisfied that you can laugh at the devil when he dangles junk. But the solemn truth is that with, we are avoiding the presence of the Lord. And I know you have never avoided the presence of God. Have you ever had something that did not go your way and you pouted for a few days? <laughs> okay, how many? Nobody, nobody else. Just Okay. If we are avoiding the presence of the Lord for any reason, we're in spiritual danger. And you say, why is that? Because we were created to be on a high. You don't think the Garden of Eden was on a high from the presence of God? Now, I'm not talking we. I'm talking the joy of a love that doesn't matter. It, we mess up and he says, it's okay. Now, I'm not talking about deliberately going out and sin, but have you ever really been trying to do a good job? And in the middle of the day doing a good job, you said, oh. <laughs> and he says, we'll, we'll take care of it. Amen. That's the love we were created for. Mm -hmm. We were created to know the same high that people in heaven have from just being loved with that over-the-top awesome love. The Lord's presence, His glory, His effervescent joy is the high that heaven lives on. You understand that in heaven, there's no market for cocaine. You can have all the grass in the world and they laugh because nobody in Colorado is as happy as somebody that's in Jesus. Mm -hmm. But you've got to spend some time there or you'll start going backwards. When we spend time worshiping, standing in awe of Him, Something stellar takes place. Look at Psalm 33, 8 to 9. It says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. When you spend some time looking at God and all his glory, you won't care what the National Enquirer says or what Facebook says or what, what is that other place? In Touch Weekly. I never heard of it until this latest thing. You won't care what they say. You know why? Because there's one who has the final word. Psalm 65. Remember how we looked at this the last one? This may be our last scripture. But you know what you need to do? We just need to spend some time quiet with God. And you say, couldn't we do that on our own? Yes. But there's a couple of reasons it's, it's easier to do it together. Number one, we're taking away distractions because we're here. We plan to give God the next 23 minutes. Hallelujah. And number two, when you walk in the door and you know Jesus, God walks in with you. Mm -hmm. We have more God together than we do apart, even though we can get in the presence of God. It's called the corporate anointing. Okay? Yeah. We each have an individual anointing on our lives, but together, you know the presence of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason. Look at Psalm 65. We've been reading verse 9. It's, but look at what is the verse before says. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. Isn't that the verse we've looked at the last two Sunday mornings? Remember how we said when God comes, he doesn't spend a special envoy with his gifts. He comes to bring his gifts. It says you visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. But look at what happened. Remember we were talking, David, remember how... We said David took a poor nation and brought it into great blessing and wealth in one generation, right? We can show it to you in the scriptures. David knew how to put out the welcome mat for God, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the verse, one verse before it. And look, how do you, one of the ways you put out the welcome mat. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your sides. Could you name me three things in your life that you're totally in awe of the fact that God would do for you? We should have that. Amen? I do one of the scripture I want to show you. Go to Isaiah 61. It's so easy to see here what happens in worship. Is John with the kids tonight? Yeah, No, I mean, is he going to pray? He will. I'll just go to the house with him. Yeah, we'll pray in a minute or two. It's, you know, verse um, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. This is prophetic of Jesus. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to captives. And then let's go to verse 3. It says that those who preach the gospel grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland or beauty for ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness. 
When you stand in awe of God, something momentous happens. In worship, we exchange our heaviness. You know that there's no glory in heaviness? Have you ever come to church heavy? Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. That's not, there's no shame in that. But there's a shame in staying there. Because what happens is you give him your heaviness and he gives you his lightness, his glory. That's right. And you know what? He swallows up your heaviness and he's no poorer for it. Mm -hmm. We, boy, this is really good. Yeah. We give him our weakness and he gives us his strength. We give the, of him his, our hardness of heart. You ever been hard toward people? And he gives you his mercy. And it happens when we worship. I always believe, believe we were created to live on a high, and, and you say, well, you have to have that emotion. I'm not talking just about emotions. I'm talking about the joy unspeakable and full of glory. And you say, I can live without it. We can live for a little while without it, but after a while, you start getting grumpy and snappy mm -hmm. and saying, well, I mean, how long can we do this kind of service? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everything gets old and hard and heavy away from God. And in his presence, you know why you're serving. You, are you following here? I don't know. We're supposed to stand in awe of his name. I've got scriptures for that. But should we? Look at Luke 8, just one verse. Uh, it's the parable of the sower. I just want you to understand that if, if you're not cra crazy happy in Jesus, you're going to look for joy someplace else. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because you can't live without joy. You can try. And you can trudge along for a little while, but, but you're, you're susceptible and vulnerable to the enemy. Jesus is telling the, par the parable of the sower here in Luke chapter 8, and verse 4, or verse 5, he says, The sower went out to sow. Remember, there are four kinds of soil. And the first kind of soil in verse 12 says, The devil comes and takes away the word. That's the first kind. That means they never got hurt. They never heard a word about salvation, didn't understand it, and they never got saved, right? Verse 13, those on rocky soil are those who, when they hear, hear the word with joy. But they have no firm root. And they believe for a while in temptation to fall away. That means they get, oh, they're excited. I'm excited to be a Christian. And three weeks later, you can't find them and they're not serving God. And we hate to think it happens, but it happens. Jesus said it happens. And they didn't, if they did get saved, they fell away. Now, verse 15 is the one we have to worry about because we're obviously not in the first two. And we want to be in verse 15 where we're good soil. But look at verse 14. It says, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go their way, they are choked with worries, riches, and the pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. If we're not just wonderfully in love with the Lord and in awe of what he's done, day by day, day by day, then the world has three things that shoots at us, worries, riches, and pleasures. And the worst part is, they don't even look that bad. If you talk to people in the world, they say, well, you'd be a fool not to worry. Hmm. Right? Hmm. And they say, riches, riches are great. And they say, pleasures, I'm in favor. It's not that riches and pleasures are all that bad, but you better have a heart addicted to Jesus. Okay? Hmm. Yes. And I just encourage you to, to, to make it a purpose to stay in awe of the one who loves you. Would you want to pray, John? I know Mark has another pet interview to take. Want to pray about right? Is there anything else?